a lot of people are expecting hydrogen demand to grow and at an unprecedented pace. And right now, the way that people are considering producing hydrogen in a clean environment or in a clean way are essentially two ways. Um, hydrogen production, the way we're doing it today from fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage or green hydrogen from electrolysis. But we did some really easy back of the envelope calculations. And so if the year 2050, if we see all of the hydrogen demand in the year 2050 supplied by blue hydrogen or what we're doing today with carbon capture, we would need enough ca carbon capture equivalent to one fifth of all of today's total global CO2 emissions and all for this one single industry. So essentially we're moving in the opposite direction of where we want to be. We want to be decreasing emissions, not making it worse. Uh, if, however, we, we buy into this green, elect, uh, green hydrogen or hydrogen from electrolysis using renewable energy, um, we would need more than all of today's total global renewable energy capacity dedicated exclusively to hydrogen production. So all wind, all solar, everything that exists today, the equivalent, more than that, and, and only producing hydrogen, which is a very, very, very generous assumption to make. So obviously these numbers kind of help put into perspective that we need to overhaul this entire industry at an unprecedented rate, both to grow hydrogen production as well as completely redesigning infrastructure. Um, and speaking of infrastructure, um, so there really is kind of this chicken and egg problem if you kind of look at it big picture again, in the sense that low or zero emissions hydrogen production, so the blue or the green hydrogen is too low or too costly to actually incentivize any inv investment in hydrogen infrastructure. And the lack of market access as well as small nascent demand segments um, really kind of prevents any growth in this low or zero carbon hydrogen production. And so essentially what we came to realize is um, what we do in today and within this decade matters, especially in growing this industry. Um, we cannot lay all of our eggs in the blue hydrogen or the, you know, scale what we're doing today without carbon capture and, you know, because obviously that exacerbates problems in the short term. Um, and so I did publish a perspective article on this, and this is kind of my vision for geologic hydrogen, and this is kind of why we are, are talking to some of you already. Um, but I believe that geologic hydrogen, or essentially hydrogen that occurs naturally in the subsurface, could potentially jumpstart this industry in the sense that resource exploration in the subsurface is already tapping into a skill set of two massive industries, oil and gas and mining. And both of these industries have extensive expertise in looking for and identifying gas deposits, right? So if we can find natural hydrogen accumulations, they could then help unlock or de-risk investment in the infrastructure so that by the time green electrolysis comes online, the infrastructure is already gonna be a place and so we circumvent this chicken and egg problem. That's a very uh, wishy-washy, uh, thing. And so obviously, um, it's still to be determined whether or not that's even possible. But the reason, again, why we talk to you is what what is geologic hydrogen? And this is hydrogen that's produced in the subsurface every single day. I'm sure you all have probably in some experiment or another have noticed, wait a minute, there's hydrogen being produced. Um, and it really is, you know, if we start to take a zoom out, so this is a, from a review article from the year 2020. Um, Zagonic did an extensive overview of documented gas seeps all over the world, and they're found everywhere. So this map here is only showing gas seeps with more than 10% hydrogen. So this is not small amounts of hydrogen, this is quite large. And you'll also note that in this box over here, it looks like Russia and Eastern Europe have a lot more than the US. In the review paper, he actually makes it a point to mention that there's a higher density of observance, observations there in that region of the world because they've been more explicit about actually going out and looking for it. In the United States, we do not have or have not had an explicit effort to actually identify or document the amount of hydrogen seeps that we have. And so therefore there's a lot more sparse data and information available right now. Um, but hydrogen seeps, again, like I said, have been documented all over, all over the world. And there, there are many different observances. So on the first picture with the flames, that's actually the Mount Chimera. It's a flame that has been active for over two millennia. It's the, purportedly the source of the first Olympic flame. And that has about 10% hydrogen. So this hydrogen seep has been active for over 2000 years. Um, and there's some similar observations in like the Philippines, for example, Los Fuegos Internos, uh, that has about 50% hydrogen on a good day. Um, or you can have another uh, uh, hydrogen observance, which are these like circles here. So that's the picture on the, 
on, I guess, my right. Um, and so what fairy circles are, these are actually really like 10 kilometer wide depressions. You could actually see them from satellite. Well, right along the edge of the rim are hydrogen um, nodes. And so this one, this particular one is one that was documented in Australia, but we've seen them in, North Car in the South Carolina. We've seen them in Brazil. Um, we've seen them in Nebraska even. And right around the rim, it could be anywhere from maybe 100 ppm to 1,000 ppm of hydrogen. So quite massive depressions there. And what's interesting is that when you start to try to quantify it, because um, people kind of ignored it or didn't really try to estimate the, the global flux of hydrogen. And so I love this table. It's actually from our colleague at USGS, Jeff Ellis. Every 10 years or so, the estimated amount of hydrogen flux increases by a factor of 10. And that's simply, I think, due to the fact that people are paying more attention to it. Whereas before it was more of a curiosity, now people are trying to actually explicitly put some bounds on how much hydrogen is being generated in the earth every day. And so the question for us is not, is hydrogen being generated? Because we know, yes, absolutely, hydrogen is being generated all the time. The question really became for us, does it accumulate? And I think that's the more um, prescient question for us. Um, and so going back a step, you know, hydrogen, how is hydrogen generated? There's a number of different processes, um, abiotic, of course. And so in this review article that was published this year, there's actually um, a list of 32 different mechanisms that hydrogen can be generated in the subsurface, but here I'll only highlight the, you know, top seven or eight. So the first is water rock reactions. Uh, serpentinization, which I know a lot of you are probably quite familiar with, does produce hydrogen in the right conditions. It is an oxidation reduction step where iron is oxidized to like a magnetite and um, water is reduced, of course, to produce hydrogen. So that's a uh, very complementary to a lot of folks who are already thinking about carbon mineralization. Um, another way that hydrogen can be produced is uh, via a process called radiolysis. So radioactive decay interacts with water and splits it to produce oxygen and hydrogen. Um, that's another source of helium as well. So we often find hydrogen and helium together. Um, another abiotic process could be even tectonic plates. And so in the Zagonic review paper, he talks a lot about uh, research studies that look to you know, measure spikes in hydrogen as a way, as an early detection system for um, earthquake activity. Um, and so that's literally just exposing new rock faces there. Um, of course, primordial. Uh, so Esteban, you talked, you mentioned primordial <laughs> at lunch. And so to be determined still whether or not the primordial hydrogen can persist long enough to actually accumulate or get to the surface so that we could observe it, but certainly potentially a source of hydrogen um, and volcanic activity. And of course, I know a lot of you guys, um, hydrothermal activity in volcano systems, as well as just any gases as well, is a source of hydrogen. From the biotic size, this is more for buzz. Of course, we have micro, uh, microbes in the, in the ground that both eat and produce hydrogen. Um, and so both are ways that hydrogen can show up. And then finally, anthropogenic. So actually our pipelines and our steel, the steel that we introduce into the subsurface will can also react with water. And so that's another source of potential hydrogen. And so for a long time, even though people have documented these processes, I think a lot for a long time, it, it was taken for granted that hydrogen could ever accumulate. I think that was the, the general trend. People just knew it happened, but they, they kind of wrote it off as, well, this isn't really that important. It wasn't until, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm getting my head, head of myself. Um, so back up. So this is, um, again, uh, if you guys ever want to learn more about hydrogen. So this was a, a guy that just published in 2022, Alexei Milkov. Um, he documented over 6,000 ob observations for hydrogen. And you can see that mid-ocean ridges, serpentinites, non-sedimentary hard rock, and volcano systems are probably the highest. But he does make it a point to say that in these systems, people were more explicit about measuring hydrogen. So you don't write off the other sources of hydrogen just yet. I think that we do need a more explicit effort to document hydrogen in general. Um, and so then going back to what I was going to say, I think, again, people assume that this didn't ever accumulate, but it wasn't until 2012 where there was actually a natural hydrogen well that was discovered. The story of this well is very interesting. It occurred in Mali. In the 1980s, they were actually drilling for water, and then the well exploded. Um, so they capped it up. They kind of let, they abandoned it. And then in 2012 or 2011, Petroma, which is now known as Hydroma, a Canadian company, went back and they found that there was 98% hydrogen in this accumulation. And so they've been producing hydrogen from that well and from a series of wells in Mali um, since, and that's really kind of forced the community 
to re-examine the importance of geologic <laughs> hydrogen. Um, and so as a thought, one, one of the things that RPE we like to do is that, you know, a lot of thought experiments, like if there was a molly-like well in the U.S., could, it, could you actually produce it at a dollar per kilogram? That's the, that's the metric that DOE has proposed, a dollar per kilogram, or per kilogram within the next decade. There's a lot of things that make molly well very special. First of all, the molly-like well, or molly-like well is a shallow well, about 100 meters, which means that you could use essentially a water drilling rig with PVC lining, and that makes it very, very cheap to drill. Um, the second one, of course, is that the hydrogen flux, and it's almost pure hydrogen, so this is about 1,000 cubic meters per day. And what would that look like? Could you get an like IRR, eternal rate of return, of 20% selling at a dollar per kilogram? And the short answer is, quote, yes. Um, but we also recognize that this is a very small well. Um, the energy value is equivalent to uh, right, uh, 12 uh, million cubic feet, no, 12,000 cubic feet per day. Sorry, Greg, is it MCF? What is that one? Uh, million cubic feet. Yeah. Okay, okay, 12 million cubic feet per day of natural gas compared to an average Marcellus well, which is like 1800. Um, but it is the equivalent output of a 200 kilowatt PEM electrolyzer. So, so not nothing, but certainly not what we've come used or come to expect from like a natural gas well. Um, and again, like I said, there's a number of things that make this particular well very special, the purity and the depth um, being two of the ones that make it the most special. Um, so we kind of extended this thought experiment to what if you needed to drill deeper, like in an oil and gas context, so we were talking two to five, uh, 2,000 to 5,000 kilometers deep. And that's where it becomes extremely um, difficult to project because that's where purity is going to matter. Um, you can see that the, the drilling costs now, instead of being 10 to $100,000, are now five to $10 million. Uh, and so the size of the accumulation, what's, what's with hydrogen, like how pure it is, if there's like things like helium, which of course, as we know, helium is quite valuable. There's a lot of things. And so we're, we're still kind of in the early stages. We're not, we're not really sure whether or not this could actually produce a dollar per kilogram until we investigate a little bit more. But what we do know is that exploration will be absolutely critical. Um, exploration and giving a, a much more strong basis of assuredness that there is hydrogen there and this, the accumulation is, is economical. Um, and so as I alluded to, it will depend on a number of different things. Interestingly enough, that data set of 6,000 plus um, hydrogen observations, you'll see that a lot of them are actually in pretty shallow depths. Um, but again, that could just be a factor of people were more explicit to, to measure hydrogen at that, that point. So that could work in our favor. Um, and the other thing, as I said, with the concentration of hydrogen being really important. Um, and the off-taker too, like sometimes if you just need it for producing power, you might not need the high purities that a fuel cell might need. But moving forward, understanding the critical elements of a hydrogen system is going to be really important. And fortunately, our colleague, Jeff Ellis at USGS is already working on this. Um, he's going to be putting together a resource potential map for the U.S. for natural hydrogen based on what we already know about the subsurface in the U.S. And so I include his email um, on the bottom slide there if you want to reach out to him. He's doing a lot of work in that space. Um, but the question for us is, is this the beginning of the geologic hydrogen industry, right? We've seen the Molly well. It, it proved for the first time that hydrogen can potentially accumulate. Um, there's actually a hydrogen well in the U.S., the first wildcat well in Nebraska that was drilled. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, we are seeing activity in Australia where a third of South Australia was leased for hydrogen exploration. And of course, um, there was the first international conference, and this is the second one. So Doug and I will actually be, shameless plug, Doug and I will actually be <laughs> presenting um, with Jeff Ellis at this conference, but this is the second of um, one. Uh, again, an international summit all about geologic hydrogen. So starting to pick up, and you heard it first today, on <laughs> June 14th. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Doug. Okay, thank you, Emily. Oops, what did I just do? Okay, um, so I'm now gonna go into the more speculative space. And so we know there's hydrogen down there. So the question is, is can we accelerate the formation of hydrogen? So this is a rabbit hole that I followed 
Kalina down. And this is going to be my journey through this rabbit hole. And to keep in mind, one of the nice things about hydrogen is the assumption is we can replenish it quickly. Unlike hydrocarbons, which take millennia or millions of years to form, hydrogen seems to come out pretty quickly. So the question is, you know, really, how do we approach this? If we find wells, how do we make sure the well doesn't go dry? How do we stimulate this? so we can get out of a hydrogen source as much as we can. And so I'm going to show you some numbers that are very large and very loose um, as we go through. And keep in mind that approximate and about, as I'm going to be talking about, are, are very speculative. So they're really precise numbers that we have. And by the way, if you look at, at stimulating hydrogen, um, quite interestingly, Google doesn't know where you go, but when you do find out about stimulating hydrogen, you find a bunch of microbiologists there for some reason. We'll come into that. So, pretty simple reaction, the way we approach this. And again, we're being educated as we go through. Um, as Emily said, we don't know any better, so this is why we're looking at it. And it's really just an iron to silicate plus water gives you hydrogen. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, chemistry, you know, the idea is that iron silicate, a ton of iron silicate will give you 6.6 .6 kilograms of, um, of hydrogen. So that's a, a number to keep in mind. And, you know, the other question is where do we find it? And it's no secret to the people in this room. You find it in volcanic rocks. You find it in things like olivine. Um, olivine, you know, the, the, I liked going into uh, Esteban's lab, and he shows us this beautiful green transparent olivine, which is obviously just pure magnesium silicate with a little bit of trace something in there to color it. But for the most part, it's ugly stuff. It's got a lot of stuff in it to include a lot of iron. Uh, on average around the world, um, olivine, olivinic type rocks contain about 10% iron oxide, FeO, uh, which is in the, in the two version. So you have to ask, what does that mean? And is there enough you know, and to make it matter? This is something we talk about to say, do we want to chase it down for a couple of thousand you know, cubic feet? No, we want to make sure it matters. And is there enough to do it? 40% of the Earth's crust is olivine or olivinic type rocks. You know, again, I am a, a, a non-geologist, so I look at things, anything kind of silicate, magnesium, calcium silicates are olivine types. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> Esteban's over there like cracking up. <laughs> but overall, about 10% of those rocks are iron silicates or iron oxides, you know, iron two compounds. And, you know, this kind of corresponds, if you look at the crust overall, it's about 5% iron. Iron's quite, quite dominant in the earth. So what do we do with this? And so one of the first things I did, I literally pulled out an envelope. You know, when Emily's trying to convince me to jump down this and you come back and you can Google at the weight of the Earth's crust is about 10 to the 19th tons. You know, 40% of that uh, is olivinic. And by the way, this is continental crust. I didn't pay attention to the ocean. Um, it is about four times 10 to the 18th or four times 10 to the 17th equivalents of FEO, uh, in, you know, in the Earth's crust, which if we reacted it all, would give us two times 10 to the 15th uh, tons of hydrogen. And, you know, the important thing is that's enough for millions of years of our maximum consumption. And this is a number, I, an experiment I ran, thought experiment to say, if we can master this reaction to generate hydrogen, is there going to be enough? And it tells me there's going to be enough hydrogen if we can control it. Um, so what are we waiting for? This is a reaction that has to be done in situ. You can't dig up millions of tons of olivine just to make hydrogen. So it's got to be some way we're going to do it underground. Um, it's thought to be a slow reaction. And, you know, again, if you go back to the, a lot of the classic geochemists, you know, they tend to view this as two tectonic plates coming together at the bottom of the ocean, some magma underneath and some water falling into it, and you get hydrogen. And that, that's the story at the Mid-Atlantic you know, Ridge, for example, where there is a fair amount of hydrogen. So it's thought to be slow or require uh, conditions. 
There's also a lot of things underground that like hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, you know, the numbers I've heard is something like 99.9% .9 of all the geologic hydrogen is consumed before it gets to the surface. So that, you know, when Emily was talking about this primordial, the question is, can that stuff get from the bottom all the way up uh, is really a challenge. So really the question is, can we engineer our way around this? And this was a question I asked myself, you know, uh, you know and I, I will say this talk has changed a lot in the last couple of weeks, because the last couple of weeks, I all of a sudden asked some people who had some really interesting answers. And I want to share with you some of, the, some of the things I found in the last weeks. So my journey in the last weeks of looking at this, you know, can we get engineered solutions? I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, so we need to be able to come up with something fast, something that we can do mechanically uh, and not just wait. And I like to tell people it started on Mars. I had a conversation with somebody about Mars, which we'll come back to. It led me to geysers um, in Yellowstone. And that brought me to um, glaciers uh, in Scandinavia, um, brought me back into talking to people who were looking at steel mills. And, you know, I like to say it also took a trip through Oman, um, my rationale of where we're coming through to our solution to say, can we engineer this stuff to the point that we have geologic hydrogen and we can develop an industry for this. And again, keep in mind, this is the way RPE thinks. So this is, you're getting a view of the goofy things pro, uh, program directors do. So you guys are gonna join me as I go into the answering these questions of saying, you know, in this rabbit hole that Emily dragged me down, um, is there some answers down here? You know, putting all those things together. So why Mars? And Mars really came in, into to complete fruition um, when the Curiosity lander went up there a few years ago. Curiosity landed, they went onto the red planet. It had the ability to do gas measurements. And one of the things they found in the air was methane. And so they're spend, NASA is actually spending a lot of money right now trying to understand where methane comes from on Mars. And one of the ideas that they're they're hoping to find that this is a sign of life. That this is not just geologic formation uh, of chemical formation of methane, but the fact that we have olivine, rock, plus water that exists there. Uh, and if you put it in with some microbes and CO2, um, you're going to get methane. And so that's the basic assumption that they're going on. So this is a community that's out there and, and is asking some very interesting questions. So, by the way, it's not just Mars. There's actually people now researching and studying, can we get methane and hydrogen formation on planets, moons, comets, uh, and the likes. And so it's, it's a very dynamic little community. It's very funny to talk with them. Um, so back on Earth, we have to keep in mind that everything beneath us is a hydrogen-powered community. So this is the one thing I've come to appreciate, is you always ask yourself with these deep microbes, where are they getting the energy? And it's coming from geologic hydrogen. So the vast majority of, of, of energy deep under the earth has its roots in hydrogen that the earth is generating. It's supporting a very nice uh, diverse subsurface microbiome. Um, <coughs> and you know, when, micro when microbiologists find bugs, they start looking for uh, ways to track down the food. So where is this hydrogen coming from? And, and so this is where I got my first clues that there's something that we can do engineering. So why did I talk about Old Faithful? Anybody have thought about Old Faithful? Who here has been to Yellowstone? Okay, you've seen hydrogen production at huge scale, right? There are high concentrations of hydrogen found in all the thermal fields uh, of, of um, Yellowstone. And geyser water is basically saturated with hydrogen. It's at the solubility limit of hydrogen in there. And the headspace is much higher. If you look down here real carefully on the bottom, you'll notice that up to six mole percent of the gas that's coming out of a geyser is hydrogen um, on a continual basis. 
So there's a lot of hydrogen and actually a lot of the microbiome that exists in the geyser fields um, actually takes their energy from hydrogen also. So, I mean, this is really a diverse community um, that, you know, surrounds these, um, you know, systems with extremophiles. So, so once where did the hydrogen come from? I mean, so this is work that was uh, done by uh, Eric Boyd. Um, and they look at it and, you know, really within these geyser fields, you know, you have very complex chemical cycles. They've gone through and measured the helium content, the isotope contents, and really have been able to track this down. And, you know, the, the, they're both resulting from iron oxide, iron oxidation, as well as um, radioactive sources coming in based on the amount of helium that's found. And it really fits this conventional wisdom that you need high temperature and high pressures to generate hydrogen. So not really great from a engineering standpoint. So glaciers, this, this is one that caught me completely off guard. And if you look at glaciers, there's life at the bottom of glaciers. And actually I just sent Esteban uh, a, a, a nice interesting article where they found a whole, ecosystem that lives at the bottom of, of glaciers to include you know fish and shrimp type things that are down at the bottom of the glacier 600 meters under ice that are not connected to any ocean and but they're all living off of something and keep in mind glaciers grind rocks this is quite an important thing that glaciers grind rocks and it's dark it's cold and it's wet so down there, you take a look at it. This is not an area where you'd expect to see this geologic hydrogen where people are saying it's being formed by two tectonic plates coming together. But hydrogen's present down there. So there's hydrogen under the glaciers and it's not accumulating. It has no helium. It's not, not uh, primordial hydrogen coming up. And so can mechanical um, action stimulate a hydrogen production? So Eric Borden and company, they took a look at grinding silicate rocks um, and, and basically asking, you know, can these chemolithic reactions generate hydrogen at different temperatures? And quite interesting what they found here on this, there's four graphs. The important one to note is in the upper left, um, to your upper left, and that's calcite. So no hydrogen is generated at all when you grind, hydro, you grind calcite. And they came back and then measured a variety of other rocks taken from geologic formations. And lo and behold, at room temperature, and actually, if you'll notice, at zero degrees Celsius, when you're grinding these rocks, hydrogen is formed. And this is actually, I mean, you know, the numbers look pretty small in here, um, you know, nanomoles per gram, but actually they correspond pretty quick to that 6.6 .6 grams kilograms per ton. Um, you can get there pretty quickly. So all of a sudden we find that geologic, and I mean, that mechanical energy is generating hydrogen. So, and the way they invoke this is actually the, the disruption of the silicates, that the silicates break down, form silanols uh, and hydrogen radicals, and then the hydrogen radicals combine to form hydrogen. I hadn't thought about this type of reaction. I'm kind of thinking about iron. And um, this is taking me down another rabbit hole, which is the entire world of hydrogen generated from earthquakes. Um, the things that it turns out dogs noses are very sensitive to hydrogen. So they can tell earthquakes coming by the hydrogen seeping out of the ground, which is another rabbit hole. So somebody then asked, can piezoelectric effects do this? Because if you take a lot of these rocks and you begin to physically deform them, you're generating piezoelectric effects. So you're developing charges when you do this. And this was some really interesting work where they came through and looked at the idea for rocks. If you deform them, what's gonna take place within these systems? You know, will you have a reaction that can form hydrogen? And then some really neat stuff that came out of this was they actually used ultrasound to stimulate piezoelectric effects. So they took basically rocks. I mean, here you're looking at on the, uh, the left-hand side, it's chrysotile. 
again, a silicate type of rock that's suspended in water, um, having degassed it, by the way, to make sure there's no oxygen around to scavenge things. And you hit it with um, uh, ultrasound, and lo and behold, you start generating a fair amount of hydrogen uh, out of the process. You turn it off, the hydrogen generation goes away. You turn it back on, the hydrogen generation starts again. I'm an engineer. On-off switches are really good for engineers to know about, right? If you go over and again, you look at a different type of silicate, you look at lizardites, and these are serpentinized rocks, basically, is what we're looking at. And again, you turn on the ultrasound, you start generating a certain number of ppms per minute of hydrogen. You turn it off, it starts again, and you turn it back on. So it's a very clear on-off switch for hydrogen. So the other thing that was interesting within this is he ran another set of experiments where he actually dissolved iron uh, into solution. He put iron two um, into solution with this and ran the reactions. And you could almost titrate the oxidation of the iron over time so that the oxygen that's being generated um, at the same time, which by the way, tells you it's not just silicates falling apart because you're getting oxygen, the silicate deformations did not have um, oxygen formation. So you're kind of complete, cleanly going along. And the control, by the way, on the right-hand side is the same iron species being ult, uh, hit with ultrasound without any mineral present. So the mineral is driving the oxidation of iron, which pulls up and, and releases hydrogen at the same time. And so why don't I bring up a steel mill? Again, this is the engineering portion of me. So I have a mechanical method to get hydrogen uh, out of rock. And so now a steel mill. Steel mills, the slag contains large amounts of iron II um, compounds in it, either silicates or, or just straight iron, ox iron II oxide. And there's a significant interest in recovering iron and other metals from the slag. So people have been looking at it and have been finding that hydrogen is produced as you start treating these um, slags to try to extract the metals out. So when you expose it to water or when you're quenching it, hydrogen is forming uh, out of the systems. And, and this is well known and it didn't really excite me until I came across a really nice paper out of France. Um, it was a horrible paper to read, but it gave me exactly what I wanted. To, oh, you read it, and it's like, oh my God, this is disgusting. Um, but you go through it and you find out they did a couple of experiments where they started looking at adding in acids to see what would happen to the rate of hydrogen formation. Um, and quite interestingly, adding in acetic acid caused a real spike in the amount of hydrogen being formed out of the reaction. You put in oxalic acid, a very much stronger acid, you didn't get any hydrogen formation. You put in HCl, hydrochloric acid, you're again fully solubilizing these iron two compounds, you're not getting any hydrogen formation. So what this has come back now as an engineer and a chemist, it tells me there are specific catalysts out there that can drive this reaction has a pretty major impact that you just change the reaction. So if you can catalyze it, that means you can bring the temperature down. When we have catalysis, we have mechanical energy now in our back pocket to do this. Why did I end up in Oman? Aside from the fact that anything dealing with rocks seems to go through Oman. Um, you know, and it goes through one guy um, and, and that's Peter Kellerman. Uh, they had active research there looking at the mineralization of CO2 uh, into uh, peridotite and dunite formations. And they found a slow evolution of hydrogen within their systems. And so they spent some time studying it. Um, and I talked with Alex Templeton uh, out at Colorado, who led me down this path. And they had looked at this. And one of the interesting things that came out of this was the type of water you use impacted how much hydrogen you got. So they were looking at this and what they looked at 
it is two types of water. One was Amani rainwater, and the other was taking um, water out of the Red Sea. Or excuse me, out of the, that's not the Red Sea on that side. That's the, oh, the Gulf of Oman. Gulf of Oman, yeah. Whatever it is, uh, the Arabian Gulf, depending on who you're looking at. The Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf. But they pump seawater. We're looking at it. Could we use seawater as the carrier for CO2 in this? And wanted to know what was the impact. And seawater generated a lot more hydrogen in a more continuous fashion than rainwater did. You know, that's been explained by a couple of reasons that the ionic effect helps the dissolution of the rocks, renewing the surfaces. It might be an ionic effect, an ionic concentration effect. So, but what this is telling me, again, I can affect the rate of hydrogen production by changing the ionic strength of the water. So what does all this mean? So if you sit down there and say, you know, what can we do? And, and you know, it really means, A, microbes what really like hydrogen, so we got to keep microbes away from that. Um, hydrogen can be involved at low temperatures. This is an important thing to think about, that at low temperatures we can do this. We don't need to be at 1,000 Celsius. Um, mechanical chemistry can do this. So mechanically, we can abrade the rocks, and most likely it's a piezoelectric effect. So that, you know, when they were grinding these rocks, most of these minerals that we're talking about, these high silicate rocks, have piezoelectric um, you know, effects when you, you, when you grind them. Um, and it actually raises, in my mind, a whole bunch of thoughts about, can you use electrochemistry catalytically in these systems? You know, what's the impact going to be in these systems if you put a little bit more of electricity in there? Is it going to be more effective than uh, Emily's, um, you know, uh, electrolysis of water? Um, and acid and, and salinity can speed the reactions or actually can inhibit it. But there's another set of data saying that if you put in certain other materials, it slows down the rate of hydrogen formation. So these are really clues that we can now give to engineers and say, how do we get rocks to do this? And so how do we engineer to maximize this? Because the idea being we might find a small batch of hydrogen in a natural formation, but if we can then take that barrier that's allowing it to accumulate and stimulate hydrogen underneath it, we could have an inexhaustible supply of hydrogen. So, you know, really, how do you do this? And so some of the discussions that we, I've been having are, I mean, you could look at, can we just drill down to where hydrogen is naturally forming? So you get down to the, the areas below, um, you drill past all the microbes, you drill by past all the sulfur compounds and the organic compounds that are going to suck up the hydrogen. Um, you deploy a hydrogen selective filter. I don't know if you guys know this, there are filters out there that can separate hydrogen at 99% efficiency at relatively low pressures. So hydrogen is the easiest of all gases to isolate. So if you can just get down there, so when Emily talks about these low concentrations, you can get there and just put a filter in that keeps the CO2 press down below or the nitrogen. <laughs> Another way is to look at stimulating via the, the, you know, the enhanced geothermal systems. In enhanced geothermal, what they're doing is they're drilling down in one well, hydraulically pushing water out into the rock to fracture it, um, and then the heat is then brought back up in pipes. So what they're doing is they're trying to stimulate the rocks as much as possible by doing this, but we could do the same type of thing. And by the way, EGS guys find hydrogen. Um, they really don't like it because um, it's you know, going to change their, their engineering requirements. But could we have this type of system that's already being done for this? Again, put down hydrogen um, selective filtrations, push down water, and only allow hydrogen to come back up uh, out of the systems. And doing it in such a way that you're, by the way, you can mechanically stimulate it down there. So in these kind of wells, I mean, how do we imagine that we can stimulate it? Um, we can do a mechanical, mechanical chemistry. 
We have a lot of information from fracking on the way you can just pulse water uh, into the systems continuously, which will renew all the surface, increase cracks from that. Uh, we can look at changing alkalinity. You will know, alkalinity in these wells, which they tend to try to stay away from, will that change it? Can we change the acid uh, base chemistry to stimulate the reactions? Are there a lot of ideas out there I don't have a clue about yet? that I'm sure some geochemist is looking at it as some side reaction that um, they didn't think is important um, for doing this. So um, for you guys, all you young people out here who think about geology and want to clean the earth is saying, and you, first of all, we have a couple of things. How do we find and reach these deep uh, earth deposits? Because a lot of this stuff is gonna be pretty far down. Some of it might be close to the surface, but where do we find the deposits to do this? Not only the ones that are currently generating hydrogen, but could potentially. How do we catalyze and drive this reaction? So how do we go down a thousand feet and get this, you know, these engineering controls to work, whether it's the mechanical stimulation, electrical stimulation, some catalysis to take place, and how do we continue to reduce the, the parasitic loads on these? So there's all types of, it's not only against uh, microbes that do it, um, but all organic matter that's down there, if hydrogen has to pass through organic matter, it's completely consumed. If it has to pass through sulfide rich rocks, it all turns into H2S. Um, so the question is, how do we avoid these reactions? And that's kind of what we wanted to share. And with that, we'll take any questions. It's a question. Why you're not including also the potential from magnesium oxidation too? Because you, the same way you go from iron two, you go from magnesium two to magnesium three during fertilization. So the hydrogen production is, is still going to be higher. Again, I took the simple approach of just looking at iron. And I'm now finding there's all types of other methods in there. And I want the magnesium to make carbonates of it. Yeah, but you still, you still can oxidize it and it still make a carbonate. You're still going to free the electrons and you can make carbonate with that. Send me a reference where like hydrogen comes off that reaction. Okay. The other thing is more common and it has to do with chrysotile and lizardite. The only concern with I, that I have with that study is that the hydrogen could be a remnant of serpentinization reaction, like fluid inclusions within the structure of those phyllosilicates that when you stimulate them with the, uh, you know, the ultrasound, you're actually going to release hydrogen from the structure. They actually made synthetic lizardite in versatile compounds. Okay, then it's fine. And then they looked at uh, zinc oxide fibers, which was another piezoelectric. Okay. And it generates hydrogen. Okay. All right. So I, I just used the mineral examples, but they made the synthetic option. Okay. Cool. So my question is about the parasitic hydrogen reactions. So typically, when you're thinking about slide reactions, you mentioned hydrogen sulfide as being a potential byproduct. Are you really concerned about methane as well? Because I would be. Oh, methane, that, the microbes are going to turn it into methane. Okay. Yeah, I mean. The hydrogen seeds might also at the surface be showing up as methane, not hydrogen, which makes it even more tricky to identify. So you might not be looking for hydrogen, you might be looking for methane, but where is the methane coming from? Yeah. That's Everything I've read that the geochemical transformation of carbon dioxide into methane is really very slow. Bugs do it very efficiently. And they find all types of, with, even within coal beds, they find all types of traces of prior microbial activity. So that brings me to the data where you show the comparison of acetic acid, hydrochloric acid, and the other acids, right? Yeah. What we are seeing is that if you have aqueous biomass oxygenase, like acetic acid or even food waste for example and if you when you introduce iron oxide or some kind of uh, transition metal oxide it actually cleaves the cc bonds when you cleave the cc bonds you produce hydrogen and co2 but when you cleave the co bonds then you're basically sending it to the route that produces methane okay 
So mm -hmm. that's your example of electrochemical or chemical catalytic approaches to achieve selectivity. Yeah. So if we can maybe do that in the subsurface, we can talk more about that later. I have a question, but I know that Steve Binder may have a bio question online for you. Steve, do you want to type it? Uh, can I say it? Can you hear me? That's not. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Well, I, I was actually about that acetic acid. I mean, that can... Are you sure that that's just a catalyst? And I don't know what the stoichiometry is here, but it could be a source of hydrogen since it's got four, four pairs of electrons on it. Well, oxalic's kind of got one and hydrochloric has none. As I remember from that article, they added in 50 ppms of, uh, of uh, acetic acid or the different acids. They were looking at it as a catalytic method to enhance dissolution. Mm -hmm. The other, I'll just tell a very quick story. So I, I did my PhD with a guy named T.D. Brock who worked out at Yellowstone. And so we spent a lot of time out there and coming out of some of the boiling springs as they you know, flowed down, you see these pink streamers, really thick. And nobody could figure out what they were doing until many years later, a guy named Carl Stetter figured out that they were a hydrogen oxidizing bacteria. Uh, yeah, they were bacteria. And they were growing on the hydrogen, and that was their substrate. Yep. Uh, but long time for somebody to figure that out. And they grow like up to ninety-five degrees Celsius. Yeah. Okay. There's also some fungi down there that are powered, in, you know, uh, fungal biomats that are formed, you know, basically in ninety-something degree water. Uh, yeah. I think fungi only go up to sixty. I'm afraid. I, I uh, that's as far as I know. Okay. I'm gonna lower my hand. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Have you considered um, sulfur at all and what and the potential for there, right? Because going from S2 to S6 plus, you have an eight electron reaction there. So you're increasing the efficiency of oxidizing iron, oxidizing magnesium by eight fold. So there's certainly less you know, sulfur around in the crust, but because it has so much oxidation potential, it's potentially very important for producing hydrogen. Uh, it could be, unless it wanted to suck all the hydrogen and make H2S. Um, well, a lot of the sulfur in the crust is, is in the reduced state. There are sulfide minerals as, as S2 minus or S2 yep. minus. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'll tell you, we're, I mean, we, we, we picked the, you know, the, the, through the looking glass, you know, as a, you know, a theme for this because we just jumped into a rabbit hole and we don't know what we're doing. Yes. Will increasing the concentration of the acids affect the catalytic potential of hydrogen? For like, for instance, I know that acetic acid has a pH of 2.3-ish. So does, and hydrochloric acid has a pH of around 1.5. So yep. would increasing the concentrations of these acids change the potential to speed up the process of um, producing more hydrogen gas. I really don't know. I mean, this was an, I, I mean, I, I know some things I can't talk about that I've learned, you know, confidentially that, that do impact it and to say that there are different ways to catalyze this reaction than I've talked about, but those are still under wraps because they haven't been published and discussed. And that was a that that article where they say was a horrible article, but it it was one that I could trace back and say, look, you can change it with pH, and that there's much better stuff coming out in the not too distant future. So, where do microbiologists fit into this? Because you mentioned uh, you found a bunch of papers by microbiologists uh, when you were looking into it. Well, they're all studying the subsurface microbiome. And they're, they're looking for this and trying to sort down the, the communities. I mean, it's actually fairly complex communities down there. Uh, you've got hydrogen consuming um, microbes, you know, that generate uh, products that you know, allow other microbes to exist, which generate other microbes, which generate, you know, which continue to go on to the point that under the glaciers, I mean, they're, they're actually feeding, you know, macro species. Um, you know, from that food chain. So it, it's, 
So they're all going back trying to figure out where did the hydrogen come from. So, for example, the uh, papers from you know about Yellowstone and the mechanical energy and all the glacial energies, those were all started with microbiologists. And as a shameless plug, too, this Doug covered just the rock stuff, but we have in our request for information and encourage anyone and everyone to respond. We're also looking at cracking hydrocarbons in the ground as well. So this is like using again microbiology to um, in like abandoned oil and gas assets and do it in such a way where you only produce the hydrogen, what? leaving carbon in place. Yeah, well, we've come across people who have microbes that contrary to conventional wisdom in the presence of CO2, they crack hydrocarbons to form hydrogen. And it's, I had to scratch my head over that one. So that it only happens, I mean, so this specific species only forms hydrogen out of hydrocarbons in the presence of CO2, which. The reverse. I'll, I'll leave that to, the, to Buzz to figure out. <laughs> Buzz is gonna be dwelling on that. What's that happen to that? Yes. I was just going to ask, is it being considered like, I guess, specifically under the glaciers, but I guess for all harvesting, is it being considered like what will happen to like the ecosystem or like what environmental impact it will have if you remove or lower concentrations of hydrogen? Um, have we gotten that far? No. Um, there is not a large lobby behind uh, microbes right now, even though, as you say, it could up upset the entire ecosystem. Um, you know, this is right now very speculative. And the question is, if we were to take the example of drilling down to it, you know, again, um, here we're going to be pulling out uh, the hydrogen much earlier, or if we stimulate it, um, it might not change the flux through the rocks that takes place. When this is done with natural gas, there are always leaks and things that don't get stored properly. What happens to hydrogen when you leak it into the atmosphere? Uh, what happens? It happens all the time. It just kind of naturally goes. It is one of the two atom or two molecules on Earth that has that can attain escape velocity. So it does react. It escapes. It escapes. I mean, this is like the newest. This is something new that's come out, but that the global warming impact of hydrogen is has, is higher in the short term than people anticipate it, and that's for two secondary effects because it does react with stuff in the atmosphere. So that's what I guess will be still to be determined. But I think that puts even more emphasis on why we need to actually go in and like characterize this better. Mm. Um, I think historically people never measured explicitly for hydrogen. We come across wells exploding in Minnesota, and oh, by the way, it's right next to the magmatic, you know, rocks in Minnesota, and they never tested for hydrogen. They went in and they... They, well, they tested for natural gas, and there was no natural gas. Right. In spite right. of the fact that the, the water coming out of the top was flammable. Right. But I, yeah, hydrogen's being generated, and some of these seeds, are, like, I, like I mentioned, are millennia old, and they're continuously generating, Yellowstone's continuously generating, yeah. all these things are continuously generating hydrogen. Yeah, and it's a it. If you look back in geologic time, the concentration of hydrogen in the air has not changed. You know, versus CO two, which we can measure increasing. Of course, humans haven't started touching it yet. How well do we know the concentration of H two in the atmosphere over time? I mean, even CO two, that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, but they they monitor all the gases um, trapped well, in glaciers. Well, in, in Mauna Loa, going back to the nineteen sixties, yes, but you know, five million years ago. They're doing things like soil carbonates and things like that to come up with CO2. No, a lot of it's being looking at, at glacial cores. That, that goes back uh, 1.2 million years, though, but yeah. that's, that's a blink of the eye geologically. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it tells us that during that time, at least, it's been relatively constant. We have time for four questions. Sure. You're driving us to the airport, right? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> um, what, um, do we have a clear, a clear idea of the sort of partitioning of like microbes that say eat 
abiotically produced hydrogen. So what percentage do that? Say what percentage biotically synthesized hydrogen? I think it's it's an open area investigation for all of the people looking at subsurface hydrogen storage, but I think they're trying to actively do that right already. Um, I think in general, my understanding is that they uh, typically in these communities are coexisting together, so maybe they roughly balance each other out. And so the question for us becomes, can we swing it a little bit in the other direction? Is it possible? And like, like if these are, I mean, you guys are all biologist type um, as well, but we're looking at the extensive species and it's generating hydrogen where it's microbiological activity doesn't exist. And that's another thing that hydrogen storage is looking at as well. So in St. Helena, we have in the same seat uh, metallogenic uh, organisms, and at the same time, the ones that actually um, some that they needed to leave, some, some that they actually release it, and the same with hydrogen. You have the bugs that eat hydrogen, but you also have bugs that release hydrogen, and they all live together. And you have bugs that eat bugs that eat hydrogen. Yeah, um. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But they're all together. It's not that you have like a preferential. Look, I cannot tell you quantify how much versus the other, but they're all there. So there needs to be some kind of equilibrium or something like that. Um, um, and again, I'm not a microbiologist to give you more than they are there. So point being though, is that if there's hydrogen at 10% at the surface, that's a massive amount of hydrogen that's being generated. It's whether or not it, it can persist up to that, like, that long and then it leaves, like, it can be sure that the generation mechanism, or leaking mechanism for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of hydrogen, the flux from the earth is estimated to be somewhere between 30 million and 1 billion tons a year. But that sort of excess that hasn't gone in, not by. Yeah, that's what comes out of the ground and goes into the air. So the, the, the challenge, at least from a biological engineering standpoint, is figuring out a way to stimulate that production, uh, you know, make that go up. Like twice. a net, net plus, like net positive. Without sort of, say, you know, killing some ecosystem that depends on it. All right. Uh, and one last question is, what do you think the legal implications are for genetic engineering microbial communities at you know significant depths? Like, could you could you just do it? Not get sued? I have no idea. I think the, some of the people that we've talked to are using native species already. It's just the, the precaution that they pumped down our containers, and so they were able to get hydrogen. So it's like the native, like so there might even be opportunities for the native, like that already exists. And under the right conditions, that there's a net positive flux. Directed evolution. You had a question? Um, have you tried looking at small hydrocarbons as a source of hydrogen, like let's say methane? I think uh, wa a water waste treatment plant uses the micro um, microbiology as a way to decompose the waste of like humans yeah. and create uh, methane gas that they use to yeah. biogas find to basically um pump energy into the plant and do the cycle all over again yeah. so have you looked at hydrocarbons um there has been work done on <laughs> hydrocarbons i mean for example we have a, a large program on what's called methane pyrolysis and that's taking methane to hydrogen and carbon and there are indications that we can do that underground so that you could just underground find an old oil field yeah, run the reaction again with a selective filter so that only hydrogen comes out. There, there are a number of groups already looking at, like methane has been the preferred molecule. And when are we, we walking back to the car? When they made hydrogen, they thought it was negative or something. They were like, oh, this is bad. We didn't get methane, we got hydrogen. But then it's kind of like, I think with for the context that Doug and I are thinking, the boil would be good. Um, obviously, that's not what you're selling. Okay, we're going to have to cut it off because we have to catch a flight. Okay. I want to thank you all. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. And then hopefully they can pull it up. So if you need any references, if you have any additional questions, you can use the slides to direct more conversation. And just want the RFI. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any ideas, crazy or not.
So I got an idea. Do you want to pile more into your car? I'll drive my car to the airport. I'll meet you there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.